uh, welcome everybody to the next in our series of the country updates from Asia Talent Mobility Alliance, or it's ATMA. Uh, this is a series of updates we are doing and we'll continue to do these updates periodically for our community throughout Asia. Today's update is in on India. Uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by Pankaj Bhatia and Mohit Vyas. Pankaj Bhatia is a director at Bedivo, has been has more than 27 years of core global mobility experience between big four corporate side and now our technology solutions provider. Mohit is a head of global mobility operations at Nokia. He has more than 20 years of pro core global mobility operations experience. Uh, he has been also on, on the corporate side of the process. Today to just share the agenda we have uh, for discussion. Uh, initially, I will spend a few minutes on you know, sharing what is Atma. Uh, then we'll talk to about India updates on global mobility landscape, cost of living, immigration, housing, education, and some of the priorities for the India mobility leaders in 2023. Uh, Asia has been a very important and a dy dynamic region. Uh, a survey prior to pre-pandemic pre also suggested that more than 40% of the total receiving and sending uh, locations was in Asia. So in spite of such an important region, we are, we've never had a trade organization which was focusing solely on Asia. And that is what we are trying to do with Atma. Uh, Atma is a non-profit organization based out of Hong Kong. Uh, we are actively supporting the talent mobility community in Asia. Uh, the, some of the key pillars for Atma is uh, around uh, first is advocacy, where we want to really uh, represent the global mobility uh, community in Asia in front of the government, in front of authorities to how best we can help uh, in achieving the objectives of global mobility. Then around supporting uh, the ESG goals for global mobility professionals in Asia. At the same time, support our mobility professionals by way of education, mentorship, and also provide networking opportunities. Um, Something which is uni very unique, which we want to definitely implement as part of Atma is about having a mentorship program. So coming back to about us, as I said, we are a non-profit organization. We want to be the authority on talent mobility for governments and businesses in Asia through our advocacy uh, reach, outreach. We want to uh, also reflect, embrace, and promote the distinctiveness of the Asian countries, cultures, and individuals within talent mobility. And finally, our end game is actually to enhance the the innovation and development of talent mobility in Asia. We are very grateful to our founder partners, Grable, ECA, Relo Network Asia and Relo Japan, who have been extremely helpful and have provided us with valuable funding to start this particular organization. Uh, coming to the next one, the, we, the, we are a team of uh, very experienced global mobility professionals, either on the service provider side or the corporate in-house having some deep, deep expertise dealing with global mobility issues with a vast experience in many for many, many years. So please feel free to reach out to any one of us to understand more about Atma and what how we can help you uh, in your organization as well. Before we start, just one housekeeping item. Uh, for any questions you have, please put in the Q&A box and we should, we'll do our best to answer those questions at the end of the webinar. So now to come to our update, uh, talking about India mobility, uh, the, the webinar today is largely about discussing the, the few of the updates on the India regulatory or the local situation side. At the same time, also discuss some of the things around what we see in India from a global mobility landscape. What we currently are observing is that while the retention of expatriates in India was a challenge during the pandemic, India still continues to be a very attractive talent market. We are seeing a lot of talent strategy changes and less dependency on expatriate population. Uh, we have an increasing trend of returning Indians to occupy senior positions in the post-pandemic world. And at the same time, what we have slowly seen also is the overall volumes of revenue-linked outbound deployments and business travel had increased to at, at pre-pandemic levels. Of late, in the recent uh, uh, past, we see a little bit of slowdown in terms of business travel and all, looking at the external environment, but the, the overall view is very optimistic about, about India. From a global mobility team's perspective, I think what was something very unique which has happened in the last few quarters, especially is the fact that while as an organization, the people are adopting the hybrid model of working, uh, there is an expectation from global mobility team to support that by making sure they analyze it properly from a compliance perspective in terms of if there are challenges in hiring from a remote working location, uh, is it possible that talent of work continues and 
we want to uh, the global mobility team is expected to be part of the conversation to help hr and recruit and especially to understand whether they can hire the talent in locations not just within india but outside india and what complications that could arise so this is the current uh, landscape of the global mobility space in india coming to cost of living updates uh, inflation in india obviously is has been relatively low compared to a lot of other locations which we keep hearing throughout the globe uh, the cost inflation index in july 2023 was around 7.44% consumer yes, the consumer uh, index uh, so we've seen that over a period of time the the, the, the inflation has been under a bit of a control but we are not seeing the double digit inflation that we've seen experience in some part of the western world as well but also is reflected in the the mercer ra rankings if you see all the india cities uh, and towns i mean have seen a, a ranking go down in terms of cost of living so even the expensive city like a mumbai has gone down from 137 to 147 uh, Delhi has gone down from 155 to 169, so has Bangalore. So uh, Bangalore has still uh, gone down from 170 to 189. This cost of living does not mean that the things have gone easy and done the cost. It's just that other cities have become more expensive, and therefore the overall rate rankings have gone down. So if you look at it, the, the, the price changes of the inflation in India has been relatively moderate in terms of managing the polar expectations. Uh, that may, definitely is not the case in some of the other continents where we have seen some real significant increase in the inflation in the cost of living, where requiring the mobility leaders to really revisit those colas as, as compared to the one happening in India. Uh, from an immigration update, uh, a very interesting one, in fact, where uh, we've had, a, a, of course, it applies to the narrow population here, but we have a lot of for persons of Indian origin who are foreign nationals have, who have passports of foreign countries, but not all of them have uh, you know, applied or obtained the OCI card, the OCI Citizen of India card. If, we, if they come to India to, for, uh, to undertake employment, they are required to take an employment visa. Uh, their spouses, they get an X visa as a dependent visa to stay with them during the course of their employment in India. A recent update on the X visa is that now the spouses can also take up employment in India on X visa. It's a very recent change. It's a very positive change to attract more talent into India to see that because as, as global mobility professionals, we have seen that many times a successful assignment uh, assignment can actually turn to be less than successful given if the family is not able to integrate and they may not meet their goals while they are in India. So employment is one such big area, which is always an area of challenge for working spouses. And this is something that is going to enable them a lot. So this, from an immigration point of view, I think this is a very uh, positive change as far as India is concerned. Uh, Pankaj, uh, just to come to you, I mean, in terms of uh, the immigration, uh, what, what is that something that you have been experiencing in, in your space as well? I think largely while we've seen the, the regulations to have remained pretty stable, uh, what we have seen for some of the clients are some interpretation being taken by some of the overseas consulates, the Indian consulates in other locations, where they seem to be suggesting that, you know, you cannot necessarily continue to pay their salary in the home location. So especially we've seen this with a few uh, posts in, in, in the US, where some of the consulates are actually insisting that if you want us to issue a, a work visa for folks moving into India, and not, that's not just for the Indian origin folks, but even for uh, you know, other citizens as well for, you know, local nationals, et cetera, as well. They are seem to be indicating that the interpretation as per them is that the we need to actually move the payroll to India. So historically, what we've seen generally is that, you know, in assignment model, you continue to pay the salary in the home location and then you, you know, pay allowances and, you know, cost of living and other expenses in the host location. But like I said, some of the Indian consulates in US are taking the position that we suggest that you move their payroll to be the India payroll. So, you know, treat them to be uh, Indian employees for all, all practical purposes. You discontinue the home country payroll, et cetera. And uh, to be honest, Dharmesh, we've not seen that come out in any specific regulations. I have, at least have not seen anything which is mentioned under any specific guidelines, either issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs or anyone else. So to me, I think this is more a matter of uh, interpretation which is being taken by some of the, the, the consulates which I've mentioned. So I think there seems to be some bit of challenges which organizations are facing because of, of, of that, right? Because 
if they are applying for Indian visas at particular consulate, that's what they are being kind of told. But when they are applying for visa that other consulate for the same company, they are able to get it. So it's causing some bit of frustration, it's causing some bit of anxiety, et cetera, to do that. Uh, so I, I don't think we've kind of heard the la last of it as yet. I do understand that there are discussions going on internally via the MHA and other authorities where representations have been made to you know get clarity on the matter, but I don't think we've seen the last of it. So yeah, maybe we watch this space uh you know to see what comes out of it that's very interesting it's a, it looks like a real con interpretation issue here definitely okay okay thank you uh, uh coming in over to housing uh housing has uh the, the rental housing supply definitely has shown some kind of a decline uh in, in on, a, on a year to year basis uh as rentals are largely influenced by location and demand i mean you know that markets in uh, there are more mature market on housing expert housing like bangalore or Gurgaon or hyderabad uh, Delhi, Mumbai, compared to let's say uh, the housing market in a second tier or three tier city, whether it's in Ahmedabad or whether it's a Kolkata. So definitely, it's uh, it's a really a supply is a very timing a time based issue in terms of when the expat moves in and what kind of supplies available at that point of time. Uh, we continue to have a what we call the landlords market in India, where rentals are dictated by the landlords in terms of what what are the expectations are. I think it's something very similar to what we saw in Singapore some time ago. Uh, we expect the rentals to go up a little by 10 to 20 percent again during this year. Uh, we've just given them some kind of a broad range of what kind of rents to expect in certain key locations in India from a, from a housing perspective. Uh, on schools, uh, the, the, the school, international school typically the range uh, is between $6,000 and $36,000 a year kind of fees. Uh, fees are definitely dependent on city, school, and grade. We do have a lot of international schools here who are, which allow midterm admissions. Obviously, it's obviously subject to availability. And the school calendar year also adheres to the Western standards of August to June. So it's been very extremely, that particular uh, facility is very conducive for all our all the experts, uh, expats from the Western world to come and stay long term in India and, and also achieve their goals for the families as well. So coming to this point about uh, priorities, something which we wanted to really discuss more in detail about, uh, you know, what as, as global mobility leaders in India, what are the current key issues which we continue to face and what we are observing on the ground as well. So let's start with the first point about managing business expectations. So I think from a global mobility standpoint, based on my own experience, I think trying to be ahead of the curve, trying to anticipate what are the changes come happening on the ground, aligning it with what the organization goals are changing as well. And as we all know, now all organizations are looking at a hybrid world, a hybrid model, where some of them continue to attend office for a few days in a week or to some people who are from remotely working for on a permanent basis. So each organization has their own culture and their own needs, and that drives their business model of uh, the current hybrid world. Obviously, some in, and it's a very industry-specific uh, approach uh, we see from how the hybrid world is currently being managed. As mobility teams, uh, my experience shows that we are far more actively engaged than before in terms of you know, collaborating with HR and other teams in the organization to understand what is the art of the possible in terms of what all is that we can help the larger organization in trying to achieve those objectives of let's say uh, remote working and remote working does not necessarily mean that assignments but it's about also hiring given the war of talent and how recruiters are approaching mobility teams to see whether let's say they can can they hire somebody in vietnam and have somebody work from Vietnam for our Indian entity, is that possible or not? Uh, what kind of tax issues can arise? What kind of other regulatory issues can arise? Whether do we have a legal entity in those countries where, from where we want to source talent without actually moving them to India, but making them work from their own home location? So these are current, these, these situations are on the rise. And I think the mobility team is far more engaged than before for, uh, providing solutions to these kind of situations. So uh, I will hand it over to Pankaj and Mohit uh, uh, to kind of, you know, discuss their experiences and what they see right now. So maybe we'll start with Mohit this time first. Okay, thanks, Anish. And I would agree with you on what you just mentioned about the remote working thing, especially the psychological, psychological effect of COVID-19 pandemic so is still on the so Population we could see about it in the fourth country with travels, remote country, remote working and hybrid. Uh, working initially forced by the pandemic lockdown are increasingly increasingly now become the lifestyle choices for many of the employees now. 
and and then the the employees now expect uh, uh, a work from anywhere not within the country but within the globe anywhere in the world as well and that new expectation means that the mobility teams now need to be working by managing or looking for managing the global work globally globally distributed workforce rather than just managing the relocation uh, process itself so and and when it comes to the policy revisiting yes i think almost all of the organizations are looking at reviewing and revisiting their policies on this companies are also now looking for the opportunities to replace the the, the traditional assignments what you could call it's a long term assignment short term assignments to get replaced with the uh, less cost or less costly form of talent mobility uh, which may be which may be virtual assignments still more of business travel domestic relocations could be locally uh, localization local class local hired employees maybe one way to transfer and permanent transfers of the employees as well and and that definitely that definitely calls for revisiting and reviewing all of our policies the current policies geopolitical changes uh, when we talk about it it's it's actually something which is very very common these days and, and like the likelihood of a crisis resulting in emergency evacuation or the repatriation uh, has increased in recent years and such today more than ever it is critical to be prepared for any type of crisis and global mobility is a key contributor to such of a crisis as well effective risk planning crisis management can ensure that risks are mitigated organizational responsibilities to staff are managed and there are arrangements to ensure business continuity that's what business looks up when we talk about the geopolitical changes recently with the with what had recently came up in africa russia ukraine we all of know it all requires the immediate immediate attention and, and and action as well wherein global mobility needs to be prepared for it and, and more often than we when then this gets come across i think we need to be very prepared about it employee engagement in let me process. let me stop you there mohit i mean let me also ask uh, pankaj on the fact that when mm -hmm. he talks to his clients about the expectations they have from like say a, a, a benivo in terms of the challenges they are facing and because uh, benivo's focus is solely solving client issues and uh, leveraging technology to them so in terms of managing business expectations what is that you would recently have seen a shift in the in the overall expectations from the global mobility leaders to let's say uh, organizations like benivo so i would say it's a mix of a lot of factors and perhaps i'll kind of touch upon the top two or three there may so one of course with the current situation the economic situation i think cost is something which is very very key so i think we've seen the the mobility teams kind of come back and kind of work with us to identify opportunities to see where there could be cost efficiencies etc brought into the into the process so they are re looking at their policies they are again you know looking at benchmarking policies uh, with other uh, uh, you know companies in the same space so that's something that is a very very high focus area second is around the efficiencies of their internal processes as well so you know again what we've seen and uh, you know i think this has been perhaps one of the biggest challenges which the mobility function has been seeing over the last few years is that i think there has been some bit of reluctance and some bit of challenges in terms of you know having process efficiencies uh, you know specifically leveraging the technology we do have you know the different uh, you know organizations having their own technologies the client having their own technologies but how you bring all of that together because with these multiple technologies the mobility team are having to navigate through different technologies trying to you know get everything together and that's kind of taking a large amount of time even from an employee perspective they are having to actually go into different technology so let's say hypothetically someone relocating from uh, you know let's say us into india you know they've got the shipment the 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 temporary accommodation the tax immigration etc cetera, etc cetera. so unfortunately they are having to kind of you know follow up on all those items separately follow up on the status of all of those items so so the the challenge that we've been working with organizations is the ability to get all of that information together so while each organization each vendor may have their own technology but how do we put it together simply for the mobility team as well as for the employee to kind of look at a one one kind of a, a solution to to kind of work through that 
And the third challenge, which we've seen quite a lot, and perhaps it kind of touches upon on the cost item, which I mentioned first, is I think the, the mobility team themselves are under pressure with a lot of cost reduction within the internal functions. The, the, while, while you mentioned, Dharmesh, that you know more and more responsibilities are being cast on the mobility team in terms of compliance, et cetera. But at the same time, uh, they, the team size are being cut. They are under immense pressure to you know reduce the team and do more with, uh, with with less, right? So, so that's where I think they are facing challenges as well. And those are other things that we are working on as well with these organizations. Right. Yeah, I think the, the, the great insights from you both from Mohit and Pankaj. You uh, coming to policy revisit. I mean, in terms of the fact that uh, you know uh, the new business model where we, which we already touched upon, and the fact that we are. I think I've heard a lot of my colleagues. Uh, who are actively working on this project called policy revisit uh, because we want to or, or we call the policy refresh where essentially we are they are trying to now understand how does the current policies stay relevant to the needs of the current organization because most of these policies have been formed pre-pandemic where there used to be a traditional way of operating in, in a mobility space but with the new world and the new requirements and the speed and the agility agility and we think the business models are changing I think is mobility, uh, you know, keeping in time with them and trying to be as flexible enough to serve the needs of the organization rather than trying to be in the still in their traditional approach. So, do you see this uh, uh, also pressure from the mobility leadership point of view to make sure that their policies are updated and are to kind of serve the needs of the current needs of the business rather than you know still living in the past? Pankaj? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think what we saw during our initial years, Dharmesh, was that we had like maybe you know just two or three kind of policy there was a long term policy with let's say the core uh, the 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 you know standard benefits etc which were there and then there was the one way more than maybe a short term policy right i think we've seen a significant change now especially the 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 theme that we are seeing is around the flexibility to the yeah. to the employee right so with the current generation that we've seen i think who are very keen to kind of move and not necessarily be based out of a particular location they don't want to be kind of, you know, uh, they don't want to kind of go in for things which were offered traditionally, let's say on shipping benefits, et cetera, or, you know, certain other benefits. They would rather have the flexibility to, let's say, purchase furniture locally or to get cash and utilize the same in their own way that they would want. Historically, again, you know, we used to see, you know, people traveling and, and senior levels, especially going with their families, et cetera, school benefits, et cetera, et cetera, being provided. But like I said, I think with the current trend that we've seen, it's kind of a bouquet of uh, you know uh, uh, benefits which are provided. There could be, let's say, around 50 items and the employees typically would choose those flex benefits. It could be either based on the value of the benefit or we've seen certain organization apply certain points for each of those benefits which the employee actually select. So it's clearly on the way of you know getting kind of more flexibility. One other thing which I've seen on the policy side is as opposed to the traditional long-term and short-term assignment, we are seeing more of permanent moves, right? Because typically yes. the payroll is being moved in the host location. And it earlier, I think we had a threshold of three or five years beyond which you would typically move the payroll. But now even for maybe a year, two years, et cetera, we've seen that trend where now people are, you know, moving payroll. And again, going back to that point, because, you know, folks want to kind of move around. They want to work out of different locations. They want to get a different experience, et cetera. And this is what actually supports that quite a lot. Yeah. Also, I would say, Pankaj, from a cost perspective, I think one way transfer is right now more economical than a traditional expat assignment. And given the current business environment, I think that also drives some of the decisions around what kind of policy to apply. Uh, uh, in, let's say, a one-way transfer compared to a full-fledged uh, expat uh, program. Right. Uh, so, Mohit, what about uh, from your side, if you want to add on this point? Definitely, Pankaj, uh, you definitely have what Pankaj and Chris and I am completely aligned with it. That more organizations look for um, what I particularly call it as a cafeteria approach. You go to a cafeteria, look for a book and you eat and pick up and eat something with, as per your dietary requirement or your, your taste of it. So that that's how it works, and more more so. Why is it required uh, to be to be uh, reviewing all the policies now? Is global mobility is now not only a relocation process management term, function or something, which is now got a strategic seat in the management, and, and uh, mostly global mobility is valued for its ability to develop and engage uh, talent. So, so uh, keeping all of those in mind definitely requires to be revisiting all the 
traditional approaches have been followed uh, so far. Yeah, yeah, sure. Coming to this point about global mobility team and cross-functional integration, I think uh, never have we seen this before that it is no longer such a good uh, good to have a cross-functional integration, but it is more of a mandate to make sure that we mobility is well integrated in, across all functions in the organization to ensure that they are uh, able to bring all of them together to, before providing solutions, right? For example, let's take remote working, whether you are a country is a country which the organization will allow a person to work remotely from starts from that point to see you need to connect with the, the physical security office, the data protection office to understand whether what those locations are sensitive or to such, such challenges or not, whether your data is going to remain safe or not. At the same time, uh, there are some countries where currently there's conflict, whether it's is that even if, if even if the employees are a national of the, that country which is under conflict, what kind of policy decisions but that can one take? So these are very emerging, I mean, these are issues which mobility team traditionally was not really that involved in, in uh, uh, those conversations, but given the hybrid model working, I think that has given a great opportunity, very honestly, for the mobility team to kind of demonstrate their expertise and their, uh, you know, partnership and collaboration with a larger organization. Uh, what happens, Mohit, if you can talk about, you know, your own experience about how has mobility function changed in, let's say, last three to two to three years in terms of the way we know the way it operates now in the organization. Very, very, very valid point and a very good point uh, that I mentioned about uh, keep, keep global mobility in the center of it and, and look at the web of the other functions that global mobility is to work with. May HR business partners, may it be uh, local HR for the compliance. So it's more important when we talk about the geopolitical things and all. Safety and security team and functions is one of the ones actually which, which we, we need to more often interact with. Then comes with the data protection. Then comes with the data management uh, and and all of those uh, alongside the, the the these are all the functions that we work with alongside the assignees and the managers and the management that we work with. So, so it's global mobility is one function actually I think which has a very many stakeholders in got cross functional integration to work with to manage the and to ensure that we work in a compl most compliant manner. Sure, thank you. So Pankaj, I mean, sure, I mean, a lot of this integration is can also be more effective through technology. Uh, and the fact that you don't bring different teams in the organization and on a normal common technology platform. And how has that been with uh, with Benny when depending on your own core, your own core experience as global mobility leader? And how are you trying to, try to help that organization through our technology solution? Right. And just, just before I answer the question on technology, Dharmesh, I think just going back to the previous question. On yeah. remote working, so I think we've seen a lot of that happening for a lot of the Indian IT companies and the multinational companies as well, right? I think you were talking about some of the Indians kind of coming back and working, so that's all fine where they're kind of coming and maybe coming on an official assignment. But during COVID time, then even after that, and even now, I hear of instances where a lot of these companies are having, uh, you know, folks who are let's say on a US payroll, Indian nationals. Uh, or, uh, you know, Indian origin folks coming back and working out of India amongst other than and going back to your point around the cross functional integration. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we hear was because these folks were continuing to work out of India for a very long period of time. They were sitting next to people who were on the India payroll. Imagine, you know, getting three or four times more salary, but doing exactly the same work under the same conditions, etc. So that caused a lot of frustration. So I think for more than us, I think I'm sure it caused and it continues to cause a lot of headaches for the HR folks. Coming to your point around the technology, yes, uh, you know, that certainly still continues to be an issue. We continue to hear of organizations who still do not necessarily have a robust process of tracking where their employees are. I think with some of the mature organizations, what we've seen is there is a process. Number one, there is a clearly defined policy around yeah. what they will allow, what is the threshold, et cetera, which will be which will be there. There is an evaluation as part of that, which is done from a employee tax, social security, immigration, and corporate tax perspective. And then based on the defined rules, they have created workflows, whereby if you are raising a request for a remote working, it goes to, let's say the hiring manager, uh, not the hiring manager, the, the reporting manager to approve, and maybe the HR to approve that, right? And then there are processes whereby automated mailers or uh, reminders are going that, okay, you had mentioned that you will be working from such date to such date. Are you back? Please confirm, et cetera, et cetera. And then all those metrics are being reported on a regular basis. 
as well and being evaluated for any further updates, etc. Right. But having said that, uh, Dharmesh, uh, I've still seen a lot of organizations who are still, you know, being challenged by uh, some of these processes. They are still do not necessarily have a very robust process on tracking and managing this. But one good thing that we've seen is I think the, the volume have been decreasing significantly in terms of the remote working. I think we've yeah. seen that across as well is that earlier, you know, even local companies, Indian companies were allowing people to work from home. Now with return to office policies kind of coming in, the, uh, you know, the exposure there is kind of getting reduced. Yeah, and, and I think uh, given the current cost environment all as well, that organizations are no longer as open to employees working cross-border in a remote scenario. Uh, they are very conscious about what compliances and all of this can entail uh, having a, a remote worker in, in some other country. And from an India perspective, I think what was also convenient is that even from a remote or hybrid working model, we don't have some challenges like what US would have, where each state would have their own tax laws to kind of comply with as well. So that is another tracking mechanism which we need for people within the US compared to, let's say, uh, what or Canada or, or compared to, let's say, in India, where you know we don't have different tax laws up operating at a state tax level. In if you even if the employees working from a different state within the country, so that way it's India, it, in India, it's a little more flexible on that front. Uh, but Pankaj, uh, uh, just to expand on that, uh, in terms of the technology solutions which you provide, now do you see organizations asking for more and more integration with other departments in the organization as well, not just an HR mobility kind of integration tool, but how the two technology can actually integrate the main, all the stakeholders together before they can make a decision. It's more, because I think as we already discussed, as mobility teams, we don't, there is, there is no bandwidth to kind of keep coordinating with all of the organizations uh, part of the organizations before coming up with a solution, given the tight timelines normally mobility teams get to come up with a solution. Right. So, so, so I, the example that I was mentioning, Dharmesh, actually goes to answering your question that they want to utilize the technology that, let's say, there's a request in the current process where there's a manual email which is coming to someone, they forward it to the mobility team, the mobility team will go and perhaps either look at the rules or you know, work with the corporate tax team to assess, et cetera. So there are business rules which are being set within each organization to determine what those de minimis are. Those are built into the technology itself. So as an example, when there's a request which is made by the employee, they directly go into their tool saying, okay, I want to work from this country from such date to such date. This is the kind of activity which I'm going to carry out. There is an assessment which is done based on the the regulations as well as the business rule which an organization has if it falls within the business rules those are automatically approved but with the triggers still happening in terms of making sure they are going back in time if not it goes through certain approval process etc and those are again tracked for building any further process certainly yeah. you can't continue to do these things on a on a manual basis even though the volumes may be coming down but yeah it's very difficult to you know kind of manage that process manually so it's kind of integrated in the sense that there is the employee who has access to it, the HR has access to it, is linked to the HR IS of the organization to pull out the information, the vendors, especially where let's say certain thresholds are crossed and it's triggering any compliance obligation, uh, a link is sent to the vendors for initiating those services and taking care of the compliances, getting declaration from the employee saying they understand the policy, et cetera. So it's very important that you get that, right? That the, it's the employee's ownership around ensuring that they are following the necessary guidance, et cetera, as well. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think I definitely we have a question on the tax implication of remote working, whether there is an over guidance from OECD. We'll definitely address this. We'll come to the next point about compliance risk, about the hybrid world. I think uh, what we are increasingly seeing a trend of uh, authorities are doing more and more payroll audits, making sure that you know the necessary compliances are done, especially if there's a remote work situation, how have you complied with the tax issues and the social security issues on those on the, on those uh, uh, you know solutions which the mobility team has provided and then following up with the fact that how how well it has been incorporated in the payroll as well because now we see more and more author uh, you know authorities going for audits for payroll audits uh, especially in scenarios where there is a lot of population sitting outside of the home, home country and terms of how the compliances are done so i think we see more and, and in, from an India perspective, I think there's a lot more integration of data between the amongst within the government authorities, whether it's you know the FRRO data or the PF, EPFO with the data with the with the tax authorities. So there's the, you know from a tax point of compliance perspective, we have seen that you know government already pre-fills the, the information through their own uh, internal sources or through exchange of information, and you also have returns which are pre-filled by the by the income tax authorities for you to file. 
So there is exchange of information. There's a lot of availability of data where the employees, uh, governments are aware about your overall working model. They come fully prepared in terms of audits as well. So it's very important as mobility team and especially those dealing with payrolls of employees who are posted overseas to be very accurate in terms of their compliances, whether it's India or overseas. Uh, uh, to because we anticipate this to be going more and more. I mean, given the fact that overall business sentiment are not very. I mean, India still is very upbeat, but the fact that the uh, G while the GST collections have been record high, there's obviously this mobility space has been always been an area of attraction to for revenue authorities to kind of lo look at more opportunities for tax collection, given the complexity of the laws which operate on from in a global mobility space. So we've seen a lot more of these uh, payroll audits start. Uh, income tax and social security compliance is continue to remain really focused for the mobility teams, uh, making sure that every single transaction is uh, well complied with from a, from a documentation perspective, from the calculation perspective, and as well from the, uh, from the payment of taxes uh, on a timely basis. So I think this is something which we are seeing more and more happening from a India mobility team perspective, uh, ensuring that compliance is really on top of their agenda as well. Uh, Moit, any comments on this point from your side as you, as you lead the, manage, the compliance part from for your function? Yes, I mean uh, these payroll audits and all. Uh, so far, it's it's not been it's not been that frequent or that that uh, that's very uh, uh, important or imperatively happening. But yes, it, it could it could be looked at it, uh, in future. And these are income tax and social security law compliance is definitely one of the points that we look at it, especially when we talk about remote working and hybrid multiple scenarios. Uh, Pankaj, anything you heard in terms of the organizations facing more and more scrutiny recently compared to previous times? I think clearly that on the rise, Dharmesh, I think the example that you were talking about, I think with the data matching exercise which is done by the tax authority, we are seeing that notices are being issued even for very small differences, etc. Right. So even if, yeah. let's say, there's a difference of 1,000 rupees, it's just a matter where it the computer throws out a, 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 a notice. So you need to be very accurate. Otherwise, imagine a notice coming for you and to answer a question for 1,000 rupees you are giving your tax consultant, maybe, you know, 50,000 rupees, et cetera. So it's very, very important that, you know, your your information, your data, et cetera, is very accurate. You know, the necessary reconciliations are actually put in place uh, as well. And of course, I think we continue to see some changes on the tax side. So for example, just a couple of days back, we did see, uh, you know, the example that you were talking about, Dharmesh, around housing, right? I think in terms of the percolate valuation of housing, there have been some slight changes which have been notified by the income tax authority. So, you know, it's important that, you know, the organization stay on top of these rules as well uh, to ensure that, you know, there is no inaccurate or incorrect reporting, which is, which is, which yeah. is happening. Yeah, great, great answer, Pankaj uh, Mohit. I think I would like, at this point of time, I would like to take these two questions uh, which have come up. One is, is there any guidance from OECD on the tax implication of remote working? So to start with, India is not a member of the OECD. It's, it's more of an in in observer status. So they are not, India is not mandatory. It's not mandatory for India to apply whatever OECD rules come out with. But I believe OECD currently, they were working groups on remote working. But I believe that they have still not come up with the final view on how to deal with remote working uh, from a tax perspective. I think finally, it's individual country laws which drive and determine you know, the, what kind of compliances are required, what kind of double taxation can arise. Uh, it's very important for people to, for mobility team especially, to analyze what is the country combination of remote working you are working with. Or or whether there are tax treaties between these two countries to take any advantage of, or or there, there are bigger areas of exposure, especially in social security space. Uh, uh, let's say an Indian employee sitting out of a, a European location where the social security laws are far more stricter and stringent, uh, and compliances are more stricter as well. It's important that uh, those those combinations are very well analyzed before uh, you sign off on that from a, from an employer perspective. So uh, from a, to give the keep the answer short, I think. We don't, we don't have a clear overall regulation from an OECD to say that, okay, this is the new remote working model to apply across our countries. I think uh, there is a lot of conversation around that. There is a lot of uh, work going on this, but uh, last I've not heard final on that subject as yet. Any, maybe, yeah, so just, just to add on that, that means I think the OECD regulations that are being specified or were specified were more around corporate tax or permanent establishment yeah, issue. So, issue yeah. yeah so it mentioned that you know the the authorities understand that it's a temporary kind of a phenomena and yeah. you know if people are working for a longer period of time 
from a location yeah. it may not necessarily be considered as fixed yeah. place or whatever maybe the yeah. case but yeah, yeah you are right yeah. in terms of the individual countries i think they they have their own kind of rules and regulation india did also have some rules for a particular year where they did kind of give some kind of a leeway but i i think it's it was more in the past is what i would say i don't know if you know that something which is going to be applicable on an ongoing basis also i would let's say if you if you recollect we had countries like australia singapore you know, they all had come up with their relaxation rules when during the pandemic time and the presence would not be considered as a p because you are stuck in that country because of lack of travel options so you know that at an individual country level employees have, i mean organizations have taken those those calls and put those policies in place in line with the local regulations at that point of time but of course now those regulations are no longer there i mean the relaxations have gone in terms of you know we, now a presence of employee in another country does, does create a pe exposure or permanent establishment exposure uh, for the organization so that's where the mobility teams need to kind of evaluate that and the second question is that uh, remote work request would not always go through internal systems technology tools to know of it earlier individuals may move and then it could come to light what are the best practices or other methods being used to manage compliances in such scenarios or discourage such requests i think it's a fantastic question uh, i think this has been a complete nightmare uh, for mobility teams to kind of address this question of people who have moved themselves without uh, informing organizations and are remote work, working remotely in some other countries uh, i think it is or this is this has been and will continue to be a challenge for the mobility team to ensure that they are fully tracked i think from an organization perspective since it's a huge risk from a employment risk perspective compliance risk perspective or health risk perspective it is important for them to understand where the employees are currently based uh, i think the best practices i think is more to do with uh, number one it's about the culture of the organization to see how they are driving this in terms of compliances or whether it's just a what we call as an employee obligation to the organization to be very transparent about the where they operating from i mean yes there are technology solutions to track as to who is working from where from you know through ip and all but i think these are these are very sensitive issues given the fact that you know these are individual privacy issues and and not every organizations would want to kind of you know look at those kind of solutions where the employees have been tracked through their ip they would expect the organizations to be upfront uh, employees to be upfront and be transparent about their needs to be working out of some other remote location and integrate this as more as a part of the culture and, and then if there are in spite of that then there are deviations then obviously you have a Uh, a real business case to kind of either warn the employee first and then maybe lead to any other uh, action from the employment perspective if there are con- continuous non uh, non uh, whether violations of this particular larger philosophy or the policy of the organization i think uh, we were, as an employer one would always want the employee to be uh, transparent and follow the conduct of uh, you know rules of conduct of the organization and make sure that they don't violate those rules uh, by you know having their own personal situations being not being disclosed by w- working remotely in some other country for many many months and just to be then told subsequently so i think uh, this is something which we wanted to kind of you know uh, address today as a part of the the webinar uh, i think one more point i would like to say that we recently just opened the membership for atma uh, in august and i would uh, we obviously will be sharing this deck with everybody uh, who is registered for this webinar but at the same time membership is, has been open for this uh, alliance and i would encourage you all to go to the website and join us uh, with in our whole objective of creating this fantastic uh, organization for asia and help the global mobility professionals uh, really uh, grow in their own careers and uh, i think there's a lot of expertise in the team and there's a lot of experience in the team who where we we want to kind of share with all our global mobility professionals in asia to help them grow in their careers as well so i'm looking forward to all of you joining uh, atma and also making us a uh, huge success uh, in uh, achieving our vision for our talent mobility professionals in asia uh, in conclusion i definitely want to ask um, in you know, the uh, convey my heartfelt thanks to pankaj bhatia and mohit vyas they have in uh, you know we were very very uh, uh, honored and very th- grateful to them to for them to invest their time and commitment for this webinar uh, i thank you all participants for joining and spending your valuable time with us we will definitely be sharing this webinar recording with all of you and thank you so much for your time thank you thank you thanks amish thank you mohit thank you, thank you. Thank you.